Welcome everyone to Wild Global Action Learning Week. We are pleased to be having a presentation, Eric and I, on ambidextrous organizations and how action and action learning and, and how action learning helps create ambidextrous organizations. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Mike Marquart. I'm one of the co-founders of the World Institute for Action Learning and was the first president uh, of the World Institute for Action Learning. I've been involved in action learning for 30 years. Uh, I'm also a professor at George Washington University. Uh, Eric, could you introduce yourself, please? Certainly. Thank you, Mike. I'm Dr. Eric Zabagalski, and I am on the board of directors for Wild USA. I've been an action learning coach since around 2012. I am an organizational research practitioner. And I'm also a senior consultant for the Avian Corporation. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Eric and I have written an article, uh, which you see on this slide, Am Action Learning and Ambidextrous Organizations. And uh, at the end of our presentation, if you are interested in getting a copy of that article, uh, Eric will tell you how you can do that. So let's begin. Uh, first, let's... Uh, update everyone in action learning. Many of you are very familiar with action learning, but there are some uh, in our audience who action learning may be a new concept. So let me briefly introduce action learning and then we'll talk about how action learning creates ambidextrous organizations. Uh, simply defined action learning is a methodology in which a group of four to eight people uh, work on an urgent, important problem. And while they are working on this problem, they learn. They learn at individual level, group level, and organizational level. And action learning has six components. There are three learning components and three action components. And let me start with the action components. Uh, action learning is built around an urgent problem. The more urgent the problem is, the more action you get, the more complex and difficult the problem is, the more learning that must occur for the group to solve the problem. You have, secondly, a group of people. We recommend four to eight people. We have more than eight. It's difficult for the group to learn as well as to make decisions uh, uh, accurately and well. And you want at least four so you get diversity, different perspectives. So the second component is the action component is the four to eight members. And the third is that in every action learning session, there's action. There's actions during the action learning session. Decisions are made between action learning sessions where people take action, and certainly at the conclusion of an action learning program, there are recommendations that have been made to the organization or to the individuals, and these, these recommendations are expected to be implemented. So it uh, always involves action throughout. The three learning components, first is you have a person in the group who is responsible to be sure the group learns. Uh, our experience in groups is that if you don't have a person responsible for learning, the group rarely if ever learns, even though they have the, the intentions of learning. The second uh, learning component is that we use questions in action learning. Uh, instead of focusing on statements and conflict and, and challenging each other, the focus is on questions, trying to get different person's perspectives uh, to hear uh, the diversity within the group, and it helps us be much more creative. And in action learning, you are in an action learning group, you're there for two purposes. One is to solve the problem, but secondly, you're there to learn. You have to learn how to be a better leader. You have to learn how to work well in teams. Uh, every learning that occurs, uh, you try to find ways to apply in other parts of your life or throughout the organization. So what makes action learning so powerful is that the the group is not only learning to help it solve its immediate problem, so a problem that might take three months, an action learning group might, might solve in three hours, uh, but also it develops the skills and capabilities of the individual, the group, and the organization, and that provides perhaps a return on investment of many action learning groups of 100 to 1, uh, the power and benefits of action learning. And let me talk about the benefits of action learning. There's five key benefits. First, solve problems. There's no better way than action learning to solve a complex, urgent problem. And those of us who've had experience in action learning realize that the more difficult a problem is, the more likely that only an action learning group can fully understand the problem 
determine what the real problem is, develop strategies and actions that not only solve the problem, but sustain the, the, the strategy sustain and are carried out in other parts of the organization. The second benefit of action learning develops leadership skills. Every single leadership skill that's available or is out there can be developed in action learning. When you are working with a group trying to solve a problem, you develop every leadership skill. And there are probably about 20 different leadership skills that are recognized universally. And every one of those, whether it's systems thinking or patience or uh, uh, influencing, uh, team development, whatever leadership skill there is, it can be developed in action learning in a quick and powerful way. So it's, you know, people may be working on leadership skill for years. If they practice and develop that leadership skill in action learning, you know, within an hour or two hours, they are much better, uh, have much greater capability of, of practicing that skill. The third benefit of action learning is that it builds teams, great teams. Uh, teams that uh, uh, solve the problems in a creative way, uh, more efficiently in a way that keeps the problem solved. It, they enjoy working together. They keep getting smarter and better every time they meet. The fourth benefit of action learning is the community or clients who are impacted by an organization that has uh, uh, utilized action learning programs. And the fifth benefit, and that's what we'll be talking about our, uh, present, in our presentation, is that action learning builds ambidextrous organizations, organizations that can do wonderful things uh, in a, a magnificent way. So those are the benefits of, uh, of uh, action learning. So I'm going to now turn over to Eric, who will talk, uh, describe what am organizational ambidexterity is. Eric? Thank you, Mike. So what is an ambidextrous organization? Really, that term, organizational ambidexterity, is just a fancy term for a dynamic learning organization. And uh, because of its bifurcated nature between exploitation and exploration, an ambidextrous organization is also a complex organization or a complex adaptive system. So an ambidextrous organization can do two things well simultaneously. It can exploit the marketplace for what it has learned to do well for performance and market share. And it can simultaneously explore learning new things and um, uh, experiencing emergent dynamic learning. Uh, very difficult for organizations to do both of those things at once uh, well, because it takes different kinds of thinking to do so. Um, so uh, next slide, Mike. Let's okay. see. Okay. 40 years of research on the subject of organizational ambidexterity says that exploitation drives out exploration. What does that mean? That means that as we learn to do something well, we have a tendency to want to lather, rinse, and repeat on those processes and continue doing those things and then we stop learning new things. So, um, you know, that's uh, fine when you have perfected something in the marketplace or a process in your organization, but if the environment and the market changes, if you are in the business of making wagon wheels and buggy whips and uh, the carbon engine the automobile comes along, you could be in big trouble. Next slide, Mike. There's three types of ambidexterity that have been studied. And there's a fourth type that I introduced in our, uh, the article that Mike and I wrote. The first type of ambidexterity is called temporal ambidexterity. All organizations do this. You could think about, um, you, um, you, and they're predicated upon switching rules. So organizations will exploit the marketplace for a while and then they will switch and they'll explore for a period and then they'll switch back and they'll exploit again. Think about the company picnic. Uh, think about a annual offsite that you would attend, a annual conference. 
And temporal ambidexterity is any time that you're allowed to think exploratively and to kind of change and switch. The next type is structural ambidexterity. This is a physical space where you are encouraged to explore, where you are allowed to let your hair down. Uh, think about things like advanced development departments and organizations, uh, rapid prototyping facilities, um, experimental research and development. Aviation giant Lockheed Martin has their Skunk Works division where they're inventing new things. The Boeing Corporation has their Phantom Works. So structural ambidexterity is a physical split place where you can explore. The third type, and I say the, uh, the, uh, the best one, is contextual ambidexterity. This is a form of exploitation and exploration that I say gets into a company's DNA. It goes down to the individual member level and they are allowed to switch from an exploitive mindset, doing what they've learned to do well to an explorative mindset and back again. Companies like the 3M Corporation require that their engineers spend 15% of their week doing explorative unstructured activities. Now this might mean sitting under a tree outside and watching the trajectory of butterflies come by. Um, and uh, that is that is allowed, they're allowed to do that. There's a fourth type of ambidexterity that I introduced in uh, Mike and my, my article that um, I call conscripted or forced ambidexterity. Think of this one as a evolve or die, uh, change or die scenario. We have been forced to uh, radically explore, learn and change uh, because of our environment and the COVID-19 pandemic. One great big example of this might be teleworking. For at least five decades, we have um, talked about teleworking and but we had to push the I believe button and actually implement teleworking during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this was a type of ambidextrous change that was forced on us. Thanks, Mike. Okay, uh, the next slide here, this is an evolution model for the ambidextrous organization. It's a simple model that I came up with to explain uh, the evolution that all organizations go through. When they're first starting out, they are looking for something to refine in the marketplace for market share and performance to be competitive, or they're looking for something to introduce to the marketplace. So that's that first triangle. As they're driving down towards an exploitive nature and doing that thing well, being competitive, the model shifts to the second triangle. Now, the what the organization does well is their explorative piece. That's the top of the model. They may be explorative periodically in a temporal ambidexterity kind of way, but they're in this lather, rinse, and repeat cycle of doing what they do well. Now, most organizations stop here, and you see that dotted line, and that may work for quite a while. It might work for decades, might work for 100 years. Uh, but some organizations have gone one step further and become ambidextrous dynamic learning organizations. Now the model changes one more time, but it flips internally. The explorative part of the organization becomes the capstone of the company and the exploitive part becomes the base or the foundation. And the two synergistically feed each other in this circular pattern. I would ask you, uh, where is your where is your organization in that model? Okay, so now I think you have uh, briefly got an overview of what action learning is, and what an ambidextrous organization is. Uh, I think we really what we're trying to emphasize is that great organizations are ambidextrous organizations. Uh, if you want to be successful in today's environment. Uh, you need to become an ambidextrous organization because an ambidextrous organization has tremendous power, uh, ability not only to adapt to the current environment, but to be prepared for the new environment. 
And so all great organizations need to become ambidextrous organizations if they want to remain great. So we're gonna now look at how action learning helps to create these ambidextrous organizations. And we'll be looking at how action learning affects the culture, can create a great ambidextrous organizational culture. It affects the structure of these organizations and the leadership. So I'm gonna talk about how action learning creates a culture that you want to have in an ambidextrous organization. So when you do action learning and you, you work with an action learning group and you're trying to solve a problem in a creative way, uh, and you're also developing your leadership skills and your team skills as you do it, uh, there are six ways in which action learning builds the ambidextrous organizational culture. First, within an action learning group, you encourage diversity. You're looking for creativity and you deliberately bring into your membership, your group of 48 people, people with different perspectives, different backgrounds, who think differently. You want people who have maybe, you're working on a marketing problem. You may want some engineers and some uh, human resource people in your action learning group because action learning encourages and enables cognitive diversity. It builds on that. And also when you're in your group, you want people to be open to different perspectives. Oftentimes organizations have people who are in silos or who don't appreciate or degrade people who think differently. In action learning groups, we welcome, we recognize the value of having different perspectives. We know that the more complex a problem is, the less valuable is expertise and the more valuable is diversity, different ways of thinking. And in action learning, as I mentioned in the description of action learning, we use questions. We actually have a ground rule called statements can be made only in response to questions. We encourage questions uh, and questions uh, get the creativity and build the team. Now, oftentimes in groups, uh, people are afraid to ask questions, but with the help of the coach and with the culture and the ground rule, questions are very safe in action learning. A second way in which action learning creates an ambidextrous learning organization culture, it encourages learning. Uh, in action learning, when you come into an action learning group, you know that we are here for the two purposes. One is to solve the problem, but second, we're here to learn. The more learning we have, the better learning we have, the more quickly and creatively we'll solve the problem. And, uh, and, and it will come up with actions that are sustain sustainable and beneficial not only to solving this problem, but the ideas and learning we acquire, whether it's our leadership skills or the strategies that solve this problem, we can apply to other parts of the organization. So action learning creates this culture in which learning is as important as performance. You, there's no learning without action and there should be no action you don't learn from. The third way in which uh, action learning creates a ambidextrous learning organization culture is that it's very inclusive. As we say, we try to get people from different perspectives uh, who think differently, but also we wanna be very respectful. And the best way you can show respect to people who think differently than you or from different backgrounds and perspectives is to ask them questions. So if I'm an engineer and I'm asking a question of a marketing person, uh, or a human relations person or performance, whatever. When I ask questions of another person, I'm showing respect for that person. There's no better way to show someone that you care for them and that you respect them is to ask them for their ideas and their opinion. And throughout the action learning process, questions are occurring. These are open-ended questions often in which you're asking the other person, well, what's your experience? in this area, or what are some of your ideas, or what do you think we might do? Fourth way in which uh, action learning develops the kind of culture we want in these learning organizations is it, great, it creates great teams. Uh, people who have been in, most teams are dysfunctional, and many of us have been in teams, hundreds of teams in our lifetime, and some, some groups we've been in that same team for five or 10 years, and they don't get any better. They're still dysfunctional. I would say that 95% of all problem solving teams are dysfunctional. Uh, people feel they could do more by themselves than they could in the team. And they never get smarter. You don't enjoy working in a team. Uh, it's a, 
uh, uh, a difficulty of the week in being in those teams you're a part of. But action learning builds great teams. I, uh, one person I uh, worked with a few years ago, he said that in his organization, he'd been in this organization for 20 years. And the first action learning group he was a part of was the best team he had been in, really the most effective team he'd been in in his 20 years in that organization. So action learning builds great teams. They're the greatest teams you're gonna be a part of, uh, teams that will continually improve and enjoy and get its results quickly are action learning teams. Fifth, uh, action learning creates a dynamic learning culture. So with the action learning group is actually a mini learning organization, a mini ambidextrous organization in which you continually, you come in with knowledge, information, experience, but within the action learning group, you create new knowledge, new learning. And you recognize that the power of learning that can occur while you're actually working and performing uh, not only enables you to, to get your job done quickly in a group, but enables you to do it throughout the organization. So once a person has been a member of an action learning group and they see the power and benefit of, of, of learning in that culture, when they go back into their organization, they start acting and, and behaving in a way in which learning is a natural and normal part of all performance. And the sixth benefit of how action learning creates a, a culture that we want in ambidextrous organizations and create these great organizations, it promotes courage in learning, that you want to learn. You're, it sometimes take, uh, it requires courage to ask a difficult question or to challenge someone with a different perspective. But if you do it through questions, uh, it enables you to handle these difficult problems and recognizing that it's not only a difficult problem in terms of the content of the problem, understanding it and solving it, but also how we work as a team and bring out the issues that sometimes are difficult, whether it's relative to the problem or relative to the people we're working with. So those are six ways in how action learning creates a great culture, a great ambidextrous organizational culture. Now I'm gonna ask uh, Eric to cover the other two ways in which uh, action learning affects the ambidextrous organization. Thank you, Mike. Action learning also affects the ambidextrous structure. Uh, the first thing it does is that it helps to change complex systems into complex adaptive systems. A complex adaptive system is an adaptive learning system. It's a living system. An ambidextrous organization is already a dynamic uh, learning organization, but adding action learning to it uh, can really propel it into the stratosphere and become a strong, complex adaptive system. It also develops systems thinkers. Systems thinkers have a holistic view and they see the big picture as well as uh, being able to converge down into the details. They can also diverge and see the holistic complex picture. The third way is that action learning helps to perturb learning with its uh, powerful questioning process. It shakes up structure in this way. And it also uh, protects against two types of inertia that often happen in organizations. That is cultural inertia that makes uh, norms and values and stories too rigid and structural inertia, which make processes uh, too rigid. So, you know, a lot of ambidextrous companies like Toyota Corporation use something called perturbation in their company will they where they will intentionally perturb their own well-running processes just to see what new learning comes out of it so action learning naturally uh, perturbs the organization the fourth way is that it keeps exploitation at bay it keeps it from driving out exploration uh, we learned that 40 years of research says that exploitation drives out exploration. As you learn to do something well, you want to continue those processes. So action learning uh, allows learning 
to be at an equal level alongside performance. Learning does not take a back seat to performance if you are actively using action learning in your organization. The fifth way is it, it improves upon traditional models and it allows for new models. In organizations, uh, we are quite often reliant on our traditional consulting models. These models, um, in these models, a framework precedes data and you find data in your organization and you plop it into a framework that you already have. But there are um, new models that allow for emergent data like the Canavan framework developed by Edward Snowden in which the data emerges in a social setting and it precedes the framework. Um, this is very exciting that you can, action learning promotes the use of new models and because, uh, because ambidextrous organizations have a two model system, one vertical and one horizontal exploitation and exploration, you can use the appropriate model um, like action learning or the Canavan or problemistic search models or a traditional four by four matrix. Uh, you have those options. The last way is that it utilizes the, uh, the science language of quantum physics versus Newtonian, visit, uh, Newtonian physics. Mike is gonna talk about this more um, on slide 12, but I will say that most organizations are stuck in a turn of the last century industrial revolution kind of Newtonian language. Um, and action learning can help uh, update this to um, uh, more up-to-date scientific language. So let's talk about leadership. Action learning also affects ambidextrous leadership in six ways. The first way is that it balances tactics with strategy. So that's that exploitation and exploration. Uh, exploitation are the, the tactics of what you have refined and um, incremental improvements and things that you repeat and strategy is that exploration looking into the future. It also develops uh, learning, helping, and open-minded leaders. Um, ambidextrous leaders need to be holistic, um, uh, complex leaders. Action learning with its powerful questioning convention uh, helps those leaders to open up and become open-minded and suspend judgment. Next, action learning encourages respect, dignity, and meaning in the workplace. Mike talked about this already, but the, the greatest um, respect that we can show other people is to engage them in the process, to allow them to be part of the process and to own it through asking questions, asking what they think should be done, how they feel, and that they are needed in the workplace. This, this gives intrinsic value and, and gives them meaning. The next way is that it um, develops systems thinking leaders. There's, those, there's that holistic uh, complex view again. It supports ambidextrous leadership models. Organizational ambidexterity has two shared models. One is the ambidextrous organization model, uh, which has leaders that focus on current complexity and um, managers focus on current complexity. Leaders focus on change and entrepreneurs focus on opportunities. And then it also has a complexity leadership model also made up of three different leaders. There's an adaptive leader focusing on change. There is an administrative leader focusing on current operations, making sure that the trains are running on time. And there is an adaptive um, leader that focuses on member success. So 
it supports these leadership models by with its questioning process. The last way is that it develops emotionally intelligent leaders. Organizations today say that uh, EQ, emotional quotient, is as or more important as raw IQ intelligence quotient in organizations. Mike. Okay, thank you, Eric. So to summarize, we want, uh, we want to say that action learning is models of perfect ambidextrous organization. So when the action learning group is working, and typically an action learning group, if it's a very complex, difficult problem, uh, the four to eight members might work over a four month period. They might meet four times for up to three or four hours, trying to solve the problem, understand the problem, reframe it, uh, get a, a systems perspective of the, of the problem. Uh, what would be the, the ideal goal uh, for working towards? Uh, what are some strategies, how to implement the strategies, how to deal with the context of the problem as well as the content of the problem. And so an action learning group, its members are balancing learning while they're performing. They keep improving their performance through learning and everything they learn, they apply to the performance. So they model exploitation exploration. While they are working on a problem, every stage of working on a problem, developing strategies, they are learning while they're acting. They build on what they do well now, but they keep improving it. And so uh, every action can be improved upon if you learn. You only can improve actions through learning. So the action learning uh, miniature ambidextrous organization, they've learned how to continuously keep improving while they uh, uh, build on what they currently know. So they, there's the ability to, to exploit and explore that's occurring continuously and very effectively in every action learning group. So there's many uh, elements in organizations that, dis that cause organizations not to be creative, not to be explorative. And uh, uh, Amabili uh, wrote an article talking about a number of factors that occur in organizations, internal, external, that prevent an organization from being creative, from being explorative. And so we've identified the, a number of ways in which how action learning uh, overcomes these uh, creative, creativity killers. So one, one uh, aspect of a uh, creative, creativity killer or an organization that only is involved in exploitive and not explorative is their teams are homogenous. Uh, if they have a, a problem that's dealing with you know, financial, they bring financial people in. They got a problem with uh, marketing, bring marketing people. So the teams are very homogenous. And you don't get creativity or new ideas with homogenous teams. You'd have to have heterogeneous teams. And that, so action learning deliberately and intentionally says that for a powerful action learning team to get great creative results, you have to have people from different perspectives. And uh, normally these teams don't, you get people from different perspectives, different backgrounds. They normally can't work well together and they kind of ignore each other or force their ideas on each other. But the action learning process, process enables people from different perspectives and different backgrounds to quickly uh, and, and conveniently uh, inter interact with people with different perspectives because of the questions and because of the action learning coach. Another creativity killer is that leaders and managers have little or no knowledge of employees. They work at one level and employees work at another level. Action learning teams, we deliberately bring in people who are leaders, senior people in the organization, as well as people who have just joined the organization. Again, we recognize in action learning, uh, different perspectives are very important. And someone who is new to the organization will have fresh questions that you know, an old time hierarchical leader would not have thought of. But in the group, the leaders and the new people, they have to work together. Everyone is somewhat equal because of the need to try to solve the problem. No one already has the answer. 
and we have to ask each other. So a leader or a senior person has to ask a new person, well, what do you think? Or you're new to the organization, can you give us some fresh perspectives? A, a third creativity killer or killer of being uh, uh, explorative is there's a natural tendency towards new ideas or so slow us down. It's not gonna be as effective. We aren't gonna be working as well with that new idea. In action learning, there's the assumption and the culture and expectation is that what we're presently doing, we can do better. This problem, this challenge, uh, we can find better ways of, of handling it. And so you go in with a bias towards we can do better. And, and we only can do better if we have learning and new ideas. Uh, a fourth uh, creativity killer is the climate of fear. And so you're afraid of rocking a boat or offering a new idea. It's going to be knocked down or it's uh, who let you into our group. We thought you were a smart person or whatever the case may be. So oftentimes in groups, you have a climate of fear. You, you're afraid if you offer a new idea or you try something different, people are saying, you know, it won't work or why are you with us? Or we thought you knew better than that. In action learning, the culture is one in which ideas and different perspectives are encouraged. And so that's why we bring in people from other parts of the organization. It's a lot easier for an engineer to ask a question about marketing because he or she doesn't have to worry about, you know, I'm not expected to be a marketing expert. I'm just asking a question from my uh, engineering perspective. So it's a, the climate of fear goes out in action learning. Uh, fourth uh, element that, uh, 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 fifth, I should say, that uh, killer of creativity is a, an ecosystem that kills creativity. Uh, it just, the structure, the culture, the values, the expectation, the reward systems kill creativity. Whereas in action learning, it, the reward system we reward creativity. The one who asks the best question will be the one that helps us break out of the box and come up with perspectives and ideas and strategies we had never thought of. So the ecosystem of an action learning group is again, the model of what an ambidextrous organization is striving to accomplish. Uh, in most organizations, you have a lack of a safety net for mistakes, a lack of value placed on failure. In action learning, we say every failure, anything that didn't work, we can learn from, we can do it better. We should actually be looking at failures. We re even reward failures because we don't encourage people to take risks, we'll never get improved. Um, again, many organizations have little intrinsic motivation uh, for being creative, for uh, trying new ideas, for developing new products, because you tend to get rewarded for the amount of sales you have or the, the results. And so you don't get rewarded for new ideas that may lead to greater uh, results in the future. In Action Learning Group, we know that every new idea, if we keep working on it, it will eventually lead to some greater opportunities that we would not have had. So we pay for learning and new ideas as well as for you know, current performance. Uh, another reason why Many organizations cannot move to ambidexterity and they only focus on exploitation is that there's a, a lack of problem solving solutions. They tend to problem solve in a way in which uh, we're looking for the, the single right answer. Uh, we, we look at what's worked and try to make some minimum improvement, but we solve problems analytically only rather than using creativity and intuition and systems thinking. Uh, many organizations are exploitive only or poor organization, poor learning organization, is they don't recognize the benefit of, of getting ideas and strategies from other fields. Action learning, we deliberately recognize that some of the best questions and best ideas may emerge from someone who, from a, who is from a different part of the organization or from a, outside the organization. Uh, Another cause for creativity killing is the lack of a place for slower learners to explore the maze. In action learning, someone from outside the organization with very little understanding of the products of the organization. In action learning, they can quickly get involved because they get involved not because they have expertise, but because they have a different perspective. So a person 
from a different perspective, if I'm a financial person, I might ask questions. I can ask questions in the first 10 minutes of problem solving on a financial or on a marketing problem because I don't have to have the answers. I just have to have the questions. So you will see in action learning groups, the people who are new, they feel ready to participate within the first 15 or 20 minutes rather than waiting or feeling excluded. Uh, in uh, organizations that are not ambidextrous, there's no allowance for incubation time to try new ideas, to check things out because they don't get the, the many benefits of incubation, new learning. Every learning, the greater the learning, the more that that learning can be applied in multiple ways. It's hard to repeat in performance, but it's easy to repeat, and amplify, and utilize new ideas, new learning. And a final reason why many organizations are not learning organizations, are not ambidextrous organizations, do not explore is there's a tight control of resources uh, when it's not necessary. And one thing about learning is that it's you don't need to control it. it it's natural and it flows and it can, you know, uh, it doesn't co cost. So those are some of the ways in which an action learning group or an action learning in an organization helps that organization become ex ex explorative as well as exploitive. Now, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about what makes the key difference between a learning organization, ambidextrous organization, and a organization which is not ambidextrous, which is kind of a non-learning, <clears throat> unproductive, unrewarding uh, organization. And we've talked about Newtonian physics and quantum physics. Newt Newtonian physics was the dominating understanding of the universe, of the, the world around us for over three centuries. And in the early 1900s, a group of scientists recognized that Newtonian physics was not the best way of understanding the environment, of understanding the world, understanding how things worked and why they worked, that rather we had to move to quantum physics. And even though quantum physics has been the dominant form of physics for over a hundred years, in the organizational world, Newtonian physics still seems to dominate. It's the way leaders think, it's the way structures occur, it's the culture. And so most organizations still operate in a Newtonian way. And as a result, they are not an ambidextrous organization. So let's look at how Newtonian physics dominates and still operates in most organizations. Newtonian physics believes there's such a thing as cause and effect. So whatever input you have, the greater the input, the greater the output. And that there's a direct predictable way that we have this input, uh, we'll have this output, and this cause will result in this effect. Again, this is not the real world, it's not the quantum physics, but it's many people believe. They believe you, there's certainty, uh, uh, that you can distinguish between the whole and the parts. And what I observe is what the reality is. So if I have a physical object in front of me, that's what it is. Uh, there's determinism, it's linear thinking. Uh, the future can be controlled, slow moving, expected outcomes, mechanistic thinking, reductionist thinking. All of these are turned on its side or over, uh, over, uh, overturned in a way by quantum physics. The quantum physics, you say the world is not a solid object. Uh, for example, I could hold in front of me my, my phone and uh, say, what's well, a solid object? The quantum physics people said, no, it's not a solid object. It's the illusion because the, it's the speed of the electrons that are occurring that give the illusion that it's, it's a solid. Where actually it's 99% empty space and the, solid, the speed of the electrons create the illusion of a solid object. In quantum physics, we recognize that we cannot predict things. Uh, we can, we can predict within a range of possible options, but there's so many factors that it is like, we used to believe that we could predict the weather exactly, more and more information, but you can never do it exactly. It, it's too complex, but you can predict the range of possibilities. So 
uh, an ambidextrous organization. So, okay, we can't control the future, we can't control exactly, but we, if we do the right things, we're, we're going to be within that range so that we know that the, there'll be a 50% chance of rain over the next three hours. We can't say it's going to rain, you know, three drops or uh, a heavy rain in, in 22 minutes. Uh, we recognize in, in, in quantum physics there's fractals. There's things that kind of naturally occur, uh, whether you, know, you, you, you put a light bulb in and you have a light bulb switching or you look at different objects, they eventually develop a pattern and a very rich pattern. So if you get the right elements and incorporate them, something unexpected, breakthroughs can occur. In, in, in Newtonian physics, we want things that are determined and specific. In actual learning, we welcome what we call chaos theory. You know, there's a lot, you can not understand it, but there's a lot of energy there. And we could have to tap into it and, and build on it. Uh, uh, there's a recognition that you have a certain amount of uh, autonomy and control, but a lot of things don't happen. Uh, we talk about in, in quantum physics, there's this, this butterfly effect, the, the old story that if you have, uh, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Singapore, it might call a, cause a typhoon in Japan. And that's the impact. Each item has some uh, impact it can change. So a butterfly flapping its wings can have a significant impact. In quantum physics, we recognize if we change one thing and change it well, it can transform the entire organization or help us solve the problem. And then you have other things about entropy where organizations uh, and negative entropy where organizations have the ability to continually renew itself, self-renew, get better through the learning. So you can see with the action learning, the six components, three learning components, three action components. And we have this model here of an atom and these six dynamics of a, uh, of, of action learning, the six component. It's like if in an action learning, you have this, uh, you, you have the problem and you have the six components, but it's taking place within the guidelines of the coach and the ground rule of statements can be made only in response to questions. It uses atomic energy rather than, I'll call it dynamite energy. Newtonian physics is dynamite. The more dynamite, the greater the explosion. But in quantum physics, atomic energy, we can put uh, electrons, the questions, the electrons within the action learning group, and it's within a small container, clear container of the coach and the, and the couch of questions. And we know that the power of atomic energy versus you know, Newtonian energy is that you can light up an entire city or blow up an entire city with this power. So, you know, like for use example, an atomic bomb, you know, the, the energy, the electrons, you're not sure if the, the bomb is gonna go off in, in one tenth of a second or 2.5 seconds, but it will happen. And so action learning, because it uses quantum physics, we know with confidence that if we have these six components, we will create a great strategy, we'll change an organization, we'll change the world with the power of action learning. So action learning encourages the group to think in quantum ways. And because they work in a quantum way, they perform in a quantum way, the power of action learning to create great ambidextrous organizations, which in turn create great products, change the environment, change the world can occur because of the power of action learning. Fantastic, Mike. So this is Edgar Schein's culture model. It's also sometimes called the iceberg model. Edgar Schein is a cultural researcher Back in the 1970s, he came up with the term corporate culture. So this model is sometimes used as a um, symbolic model, sometimes a rational model, sometimes a functional model. And that's the way Shine mostly talked about it and how we're gonna talk about it today. It shows observability, what people see, it shows cultural observability, what people see of the organization from a cultural aspect uh, externally as well as internally. So as looking at the top of the pyramid, 
what is most visible in an organization are the symbols and artifacts and the behaviors of the individuals. This could be the marquee on the building. It could be the furniture in the lobby. It could be the dress code of the employees and it's most observable. Now in the middle, you have the espoused values. Um, and these are less uh, observable. Um, and they are things like the, uh, what the organization says, their rules uh, could be their vision statement, company HR manual um, scripts. Now, I drew a water line here, and that's where the iceberg model is all uh, often depicted like this. The hardest things to observe in an organization culturally are the underlying assumptions. Now, this is what the organizational members say when they're in a safe environment, or what they say behind the scenes, or you know what they really say about the organization. And these are the hardest things to see and to get to. It's very hard to get to the underlying assumptions in an organization. Well, there are arrows, uh, and you see the observability arrow here going up. But there are also arrows internal to the model uh, going up and down. There is a downward arrow that signifies correlation. And what this says is that if the symbols and artifacts and behaviors correlate with the values of the organization, then the underlying assumptions also correlate. You have a correlation all the way down. There's also an arrow that goes up and it says that if the, um, if the underlying assumptions um, are not, do not correlate with the values or the symbols or behaviors, uh, that uh, that is also going to be observable. And you're, uh, bound, you're going to have problems or surprises culturally. Oh, uh, what is this, what is action learning uh, bring to this model and to an ambidextrous organization with their culture model. It, it, the action learning teams and the process of action learning oh, obliterates these underlying assumptions, or you could say that it correlates these underlying assumptions so that the, the symbols and artifacts and behaviors of the organizational members are aligned and in correlation with the espoused values, what the leadership says they should do. And there really are no uh, underlying assumptions that don't match with the whole model. So you have a um, you have an integrated culture, uh, you know, one that is um, that works together. Mike, anything to add to that? No, you did an excellent job there, Eric. So we um, our what did our research uh, suggest regarding action learning and uh, how it helps to uh, promote and even create an ambidextrous dynamic learning organization? Uh, Mike and I came, came up with a, with a couple of things as a result of this research paper. And uh, the one of them, the first one is that the use of uh, updated operating language taken from, um, from relativity, uh, quantum physics, and quantum mechanics uh, can really uh, bolster a learning organization and, and help to create a dynamic learning organization. You know, those Newtonian uh, uh, physics language that we saw, they, Mike, as Mike said, um, they were added to with quantum physics. So, you know, you could think of those Newtonian physics principles and language as the exploitive side of the organization. And the, um, the ambidextrous side, the explorative side is that um, language that action learning promotes uh, quantum mechanics and quantum thinking. So you have the benefit of both depending on which model you want to use, the vertical or the horizontal exploitive or explorative. The second thing was that 
uh, was using action learning to promote the sustainment of an ambidextrous organization. In my research on organizational ambidexterity, I expected to discover that the ambidextrous organization was rare and that it would be a really a rare thing if you could achieve that, but that wasn't the case. What I actually discovered was that um, ambidextrous organizations can spark quite regularly um, and then go away, perhaps that temporal ambidexterity. The real uh, trick, the real important thing there was the sustainment of a dynamic learning organization, the sustainment of ambidexterity and keeping exploitation from driving out exploration. Using action learning regularly in organizations can create the uh, that sustainable dynamic learning organization that is always exploring and rolling that new exploration into its exploitive practices. The next way is um, uh, using the ambidextrous uh, evolution model to understand the creation and sustainment of an ambidextrous organization. I, I made that model as simple as possible for a reason so that it could generate great questions and great understanding and learning about not only where your organization is um, and why, but where you want to go. The last thing that, uh, that Mike and I discovered was that action learning really helps with perturbation, intentionally perturbing and shaking up your, or your organization's structure and culture so that they never become too rigid so that they can stay resilient and stay flexible. Mike. That's our, our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas, you want to know more, uh, please contact me. If you would like a copy of uh, the research paper that Mike and I wrote, please email me. I'll be happy to send it. If you have, and if you have any specific uh, questions for Mike or for the both of us, I would be happy to pass those on. And I'm, uh, I am delighted to be able to uh, give this presentation today. It's a lot of fun, Mike. Yeah, thank you all very much for attending this presentation. We wish you the best of luck. Enjoy the rest of uh, Action Learning Week.